So we're going to start talking about factor safety design and retaining walls. Up until now, we've only talked about finding pressures and then taking those pressures and turning them into forces. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to get pressures and forces, whether it's Rankine or Coulomb, maybe it's even hydrostatic force from water. Now that we've figured out how to get those forces, let's figure out how to figure out to determine if the wall is going to be safe or not. So um, here's a quick example of a condition where a uh, wall started to overturn and uh, this is a structural failure most likely uh, it's hard to say for sure and after the fact they came in and put these buttresses in to stabilize it and and there's additional cracks in the uh, wall that you can't see in the photo so there's going to be four mechanisms that we look at. Uh, one of them we've already seen in class, that's bearing capacity. So that's going to be just like any other type of bearing capacity analysis. In this case, it's always going to be eccentric because this resultant is going to be inclined. Um, and so we'll look at that, but we're going to basically treat it like a bearing capacity problem. So we won't focus very much attention on it. Um, and then overturning and we'll choose a point of rotation. And then finally sliding and sliding is going to be a sum of forces in the x direction uh, and, and general failure is going to be something we can't really look at because you need to use computer software to solve for the location of this slip surface but uh, that's another mechanism so when we're looking at the bearing capacity analysis the primary concern is uh, going to be the pressure and also the location of the resultant so um, if we had a really high driving force what it's going to tend to do is incline the result. Now remember the resultant force includes the weight of this uh, entire retaining wall and the mass of soil that's sitting on top of the heel of the retaining wall. So we'll take uh, the driving forces from the soil and uh, the, the dead weight of the soil and the retaining wall and we need to make sure that the resultant of that uh, lands within uh, the middle one-third of the retaining wall. So uh, there's a technique for calculating the eccentricity and uh, we went through that in, in the bearing capacity section um, and we just need to make sure that that eccentricity is less than B which is the width of the base uh, over six and as long as that happens then that means that the uh, resultant lands within the middle one-third and uh, we can also use that eccentricity value to calculate the maximum and minimum uh, pressures at the toe of the wall. And we can calculate an equivalent pressure. Again, we'd probably need to use Vesic for this because there's a shear force that's driving uh, the wall uh, towards the location of the failure. And so there's an additional resultant that happens because of that. The next failure mechanism is overturning. And so um, the factor of safety in overturning is uh, the sum of the moments that are going to resist failure and, uh, over the sum of the moments that are going to drive failure. So, So uh, I probably should have chosen different colors. Uh, we'll, we'll change the color here in a second. Um, so if we think about what are the resisting moments, um, each of these forces that I'm going to draw have a corresponding moment arm. So we've got uh, this weight. Uh, we've got, and so this is broken into similar, uh, simple triangle and rectangle shapes that are easy to calculate the weights and the areas of. So we've got this weight, and each of those, we're going to sum our moments about location at C. And so each of these forces have a, a corresponding moment arm. So we would take this arm 5 and weight 5 and multiply them together, and that would count for a resisting moment. So of all the resisting moments that we have, 
Um, we've got the, the mass of the soil. It's also a resisting moment. Um, and there's a little bit of a passive force here that would be a resisting moment. It, typically, we're not going to count. It's going to be rel relatively small value and also a small moment arm, so it won't have a significant impact. There's the possibility someone might come along and excavate in front of the wall, and so that's another reason maybe we wouldn't want to count that. Um, and then let's look at the driving forces. So uh, for the driving forces, um, let's start by looking at just the horizontal component of the soil pressure. And so again, what we're saying here, oops, is that um, this entire mass of material is almost like dead weight and that um, we're gonna calculate the pressure along the back side of this and that pressure distribution is going to be inclined in this case by beta because this is following Rankine but if we were to follow Coulomb then it would be inclined by the the friction of the backfill material so um, and potentially alpha if there's a back angle on the wall so we've got a driving moment uh, here, this location, uh, sorry, that's a driving force. And then if we extend out, let me switch back to green. If we extend out our point of rotation, then we've also got this arm for the driving moment. Let's say it's active pressure. So I put a sub A there for active. Now, there's some debate, and it's open to interpretation, um, whether or not this vertical component that's acting downwards is a resisting moment, or it could be a negative driving moment. And you'll get a different factor of safety. So if you always include this as a resisting moment, uh, that will give you a conservative approach. So it starts to become a bookkeeping exercise. It's probably a good idea to set up a table, especially if you have a lot of different shapes. Here we've got uh, several shapes. Each of those shapes are gonna have their own uh, mass or force, and then a corresponding moment arm. Factor safety for sliding is the next approach, and so it's gonna be the same uh, idea, factor of safety is gonna be the sum of the resisting forces over the sum of the driving forces. And So we've got to figure out all of the resisting and driving forces, and this is just going to be in the x direction. So we're worried about this thing translating, and so we just need to know what the forces are in the x direction. But to get some of those forces, we also need to know the vertical forces, because one of the resisting forces is the friction along the bottom of this. And so uh, to get that friction, We're gonna take the sum of the vertical forces and then multiply it by some coefficient of friction. And then sometimes uh, we'll also add a cohesion factor. So that's uh, possibly uh, a cohesion times the bottom width. Um, now it's also common to reduce both of those. So uh, the actual answer might look something like some of the vertical forces uh, times the tangent of 0 0.75 of the friction angle of the base material. So 
if this material is different than the backfill material, you would want to use that. And, it, and so this 0.75 reduction has to do with the type of material and how clean the bottom is. Um, so th there are situations where this 0.75 might change. Um, but in this case, this seems pretty reasonable. And then plus C prime times another, let's say, uh, one half base. Because we don't want to count cohesion too much. Oftentimes that is an apparent cohesion that's not always there. So we have uh, the friction along the bottom that's going to resist. And then we've got the hor just the horizontal component of the resultant. So if our real resultant looked something like this because it's inclined, uh, the vertical part is going to be lumped into the sum of vertical forces. So we're just looking at the horizontal forces now. Um, so the horizontal driving component is, uh, is going to be uh, just the active material. And then potentially we would have a passive force also resisting and it will be up to us to decide whether or not we want to count that because there may be a case where someone comes along and excavates at the toe of the footing. Now there's some things that you can do to increase the passive force. So if we know that we need to count that, um, we can put a keyway in here at any of these locations and get additional frictional component at the bottom of the wall. Of course, in any of these cases, we can extend the back of this and get additional resisting uh, capacity. So one simple way to improve your factor of safety is just to extend the heel. Now that can be more expensive to build. It may be in your benefit to extend the toe. Um, so you'll have to decide the extending the toe uh, helps more with overturning than it does with sliding. So uh, that's going to be basically the end of the material that we need to learn to be able to work problems relating to the factor of safety of retaining walls. Now there's additional considerations that we need to think about. Uh, the most, the, one of them is settlement and then another would be drainage. So for settlement, um, we need to consider uh, this just like a settlement problem for, for bearing capacity. So um, that's not exactly perfect, but um, it's something that we need to go with. One way that you might look at that is using a Q equivalent approach. So you would calculate Q equivalent, and the idea is that if we look at the bottom of our retaining wall, there's going to be a distributed pressure along the bottom that is going to be inclined. And so there's a, a technique that's presented in the bearing capacity approach that you would reduce the dimension of the footing, B, to get a, a uniform pressure distribution along the bottom. So that might be one approach that you could go for. Um, there's others, you could do a combination, um, but it's still going to be for uh, a linear wall and, and most walls are not, are not continuous. And then you need to start thinking about, well, what about differential settlement? Is it gonna, is it gonna bow in the middle? And that's gonna start to become a finite element problem. Um, all of these walls should have some consideration for drainage. Um, if we think about an equivalent fluid pressure method, uh, it turns out that uh, oftentimes granular materials have a lower equivalent fluid pressure than water. What that means is that if we had uh, a, a retaining wall with just sand, um, we might get an acceptable factor of safety, but if we had to retain the sand and the water, we might double the driving forces. So it's really important to build that into consideration. Now sands and gravels are gonna drain really effectively. Um, so this is a bigger consideration for walls that have that are like a clay or a silt material. And uh, these, two, these three figures all show different techniques for adding drainage. So what one thing to really point out is if we compare uh, this, these two here, A and B, that they've both got about the same amount of gravel, but one of them makes a significantly better improvement uh, to the pore pressure distribution along the plane of failure, where we might expect to see uh, some movement. And so it's, it's really a lot better solution to add drainage at the bottom. Another thing that uh, having drainage along the back face of the wall will do is encourage water to flow from the surface into our drainage layer. 
And that can actually make things worse. I've seen some case studies where people had um, stormwater structures within a wall. So there was uh, an area inlet, water was draining into that, and something happened within the piping network that dislodged. And so now all of a sudden you're draining water directly into your retaining wall and it wasn't considered in, in construction. And so it caused a failure and, and you know, of course, lawsuits. So uh, that's going to wrap up all that we need to talk about for uh, retaining wall factor safety design. The next thing that we're going to do is uh, do some examples. We're going to take some of those pressured and forced uh, examples that we did and just continue that out until we get a factor of safety for sliding and or overturning. And then the last thing that we need to do is just look at some other types of walls. So mechanically stabilized earth walls, sheet pile walls, and other things to consider when we're building walls.